and uh, thank you let me share the slide yes uh, so uh, can you see the screen yeah yeah we are able to see the screen okay uh, thank you uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction uh, i don't know i deserve bit or not but uh, anyway i will i'll i am also a learner in this topic so i'll try to share with you whatever we have we teach or we, we have studied also um, so let me introduce myself i am vikram uh, i am from the department of computer science at iit sarapur and this is my email uh, you can please note down my email so if you have any queries uh, further you can always email me also i would like to mention that we are we are a nodal center for the national supercomputing mission uh, basically it is national national supercomputing and ai mission and one of our goal is to uh, disseminate information about use of uh, ai use of supercomputing in in various fields so agriculture is one uh, definite field where we are very much interested we we held some workshops uh, but uh, uh, we can tell you that there is lot more to be done and if anybody is interested in ai application we also have a big supercomputer if anybody wants to submit their job or use the supercomputer uh, they are welcome if you contact me i can i can tell you so um, uh, just tell me is is my slide uh, changing or not the next slide can you see deep learning based on neural network yes so sir can, yes sir it's, it's yes, changing, it's changing. Yes. okay okay no thank you thank you no problem then then well, let me continue uh, and so what i way i structured today's talk is that because this workshop is about uh, time series analysis for various agricultural application and uh, in the modern day time series of course time series is a very niche topic in statistics um, very uh, huge body of literature ex exists actually dr jha himself is a pioneer in applying time series analysis and modern time series analysis to various problems including price forecasting and others so we when we study that we read his paper also so uh, it is my honor that we, i am i have an opportunity to study he is the world expert in this that in here i mean let us go forward with the, the business so the things that um, many of the modern time series analysis you can read the papers of uh, professor jain in this regard are about neural network so they use lot of machine learning technique so uh, statistical technique the disadvantage is for non linear data it sometimes is not so or does not work so well so that's why this machine learning all these techniques coming and there has been a huge uh, explosion of application of uh, machine learning to all this problem so what i will try, try to do is that i will i am uh, and also among machine learning what has happened is that last 4 5 years it is mainly about deep learning and so what i'll try to do first is that i will explain some of the basics of deep learning Now, of course i should admit that uh, it is a semester long course so trying to cover it in one and half hour is uh, is difficult but anyway i'll try to give an overview and then what i will do i'll explain one of the uh, in detail uh, the state of the art literature in application of deep learning to one of the time series forecasting problem which is yield prediction in which is yield prediction cop so that will be and i will explain how this deep learning algorithm has successfully um, um, solved many of the problems and has improved over the classical uh, techniques uh, okay so coming back to deep learning it is the, the it actually uh, deep learning exploded only in the recent uh, past that means last 4 5 years uh, before that it was relatively unknown not 4 5 5 6 years before that it was relatively unknown and uh, and there has been a, a, a huge explosion i think all of you know that 
But the whole idea why this uh, deep learning and other came is that uh, they took forward the idea that of neural network. So what neural network said, they tried to represent the basic uh, nervous system, the neural network structure of the brain to solve different problems to for prediction problem, other problems they tried to use it. And what deep uh, learning architectures did was that they kind of uh, extended it further. They said that it is not just use of neural network, you can use uh, a, a stratified architecture, like just in the brain. So different levels of processing in there. And there is a, there is a deep processing. So uh, try to make that structure, the structure of the human brain, or, or rather it's not the structure, the way information is processed, that thing they tried to mimic. And then what happened is that the, uh, the architectures actually, they found that it can be a normal neural network, but the number of layers in the neural network should be very high. It should be quite high, otherwise it will not work. Uh, so that's why they called it deep learning. And as it turned out that it was, it is a, it was a very successful application, like, uh, Many application, all these big companies like uh, Google, Yahoo, and all those things. In many of their uh, Facebook, in many of their real life application, it was found that uh, these uh, deep learning architectures worked very well. They were very popular, and then uh, the, that uh, that was a good thing, and that that only actually led to the explosion. Parallelly, what happened was a lot of hardware lot of hardware was uh, available. All these GPU, uh, NVIDIA GPU and other, these things were available. And these things also led to the uh, a huge development. And these things made all this possible. I think all of you know this, those who have used deep learning will know this. And based on this, and currently the phase is people not only propose new kind of deep learning architecture, which we'll see in the course of this tutorial, how they came up, they also apply to several new applications which are unthinkable. And agriculture is one of the major applications where it is used. Okay, so I'll talk about in, that in the next session, but this session, what I will do, I will give this basics of this deep learning, which I think will be helpful anybody if you are planning to use it. Okay, so as I said, it is based on the neural network and the basic unit so maybe some of these uh, foundations you know but anyway i'm going through it so that uh, the picture becomes uh, clear when i talk about the deep learning i think okay so the basic unit of any neural network is something called a perceptron or a single neuron so which is a very simple uh, logic gate like structure so if you have in electronics logic gate, like AND gate, OR gate, simple structure. It is a very simple structure like that. And not only as a, as a logic gate structure, you can think of it as a simple geometry decision boundary kind of thing. It's a linear decision boundary kind of, you can think of it like this. So the idea of this logic gate is very simple. It is slightly more complicated, complicated than a individual AND gate or OR gate. Uh, but nevertheless, still very simple. And that is one of the hallmark of this system. The individual neurons are very simple units, very, very simple mathematical units, very cheap. And uh, But whenever you connect them up, these simple units start solving complex problems. So that is the whole idea. That is how any brain also, any biological uh, nervous system also works. Okay, so the thing is like this. Mm, you have some inputs. Okay, so one point let me mention here is uh, typically the problem that you would like to solve uh, is that based on some inputs, you try to predict the output. Let me give some examples. Say the input is a set of pixel representing a face. The output is maybe the, uh, the type of person, it is a Indian or American. Or maybe the input is a set of uh, climate parameters, say weather, temperature, and maybe the output is um, maybe the yield of a crop. Okay, so usually 
the the kind of problems that you try to solve will 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 call it a prediction problem because based on some input it is predicting some output and it should be a correct prediction or a very low error prediction okay and often what is happen often not always what happens is that the input whatever from you have the, have the input you can represent it as a vector of certain size maybe 5 or 6 or 10 or 100 or 1000 size vectors you can represent it as a vector often that we call as the input vector okay typically these are certain observation for example if you are looking at climate this is let's say temperature pressure such things at one or more points if you are looking at face recognition maybe it's the value of a pixel of the image so this is a set of observation or set of measurements or set of notified values and that we call as a unit input vector x1 x2 up to let's say if there are n such or m such input values x1 it's a vector of size m okay then what happens is that each of these input x1 x2 up to xn they get multiplied with a set of weights that means some weights are attached to them some input is more important other input is not so important based on this some weights are attached say it's w1 w2 w3 call it so then finally what you do you add up these weighted inputs you add up these weighted inputs uh, uh, so you basically calculate w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus w and xm and that is the summation and then you add a bias to it okay so this bias also sometimes can be thought of it is another weight sometimes called w naught and there is a constant input of one. So it is one times W naught. Instead of B, you can write it as W naught. Okay, so finally, output of this, after this summing function is what is called the induced fill new. So in the, or V, you can call it. This V is W1 X1 plus W2 X2 plus W3 X3 plus B. That is the value of V. And what we do is that, so now, let's say let's say i want to take a just like a gate a logic gate it has two values it will give a value one true or zero false let's say i i but this uh, finally this neuron will say will accept or reject the input it will say yes or no let's say not always you will see that actually uh, that is one extreme case it can have in between values also so what this activation function does it tries to convert this induced field V into such an output, which will give us the prediction. Into such an output, which will give us, let's call it as Y. And this function, so basically Y equal to this activation function F of V. It's Y equal to F of V. Okay, so that's what it calculates. I think uh, I am, maybe I'm sounding very simple to you, but, uh, but uh, okay, these are the basics. So. Uh, I think it will, maybe it is sounding very simple, but please uh, go through it also. Okay. And uh, there are different type of activation functions that you choose. You can choose a, uh, okay, some of the mathematical symbols have gone away. Anyway, you can choose a step function, which is like, if input is less than zero, it is zero. If V is less than zero, it is G or zero or some value C. It is zero and if it is greater than that in this one instead of zero or one you can have two distinct values a and b it can be a ramp function that is it's up to zero it is some value and then it uh, linearly increases to another value then it constantly maintains that value okay finally but but the problem with the step function and the ramp function is that uh, they are not differentiable at every point. The step function is not differentiable at uh, this corner, this value C. And similarly, the ramp function is also not differentiable at this corner. So, uh, uh, to allow this differentiability or make it more smooth, you 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 kind of smooth this uh, this uh, uh, step function and make it look like a S, a English alphabet S. 
still there is saturation that means for very low values of the input it will be zero for very high values it will be one in between instead of a step it is a smooth variation okay you can okay the equation have completely gone wrong but anyway you can also make a gaussian function i mean which is like a bell separate function instead of a step function Okay, so this is what uh, it can be. It, it finally looks like you apply the activation function. Let's say the sigmoid application function, um, activation function f x, which is one by one plus e to the power x. The good thing about this activation, the, so this s separate structure is the sigmoid. It is not just one function. It can be one by one plus e to the power x. It can be it can be um, tan hyperbolic of x uh, several possibilities a logistic function of x many possibilities are there but the thing is that the derivative of this function is very easy to calculate so if we call fx as the sigmoid function derivative of fx is nothing but fx into one minus fx you can easily check any e to the power this kind of function will have this property derivative of fx is fx into one minus fx and that's a good thing because we'll see that we'll use this derivative. Okay, so this can be used. Okay, so the problem with this with this single perceptron, as you might know, is that if you think carefully, if you think carefully, let us come back to this this picture. So if you consider if there are m inputs, m dimensional space, if you consider the m dimensional space, every input is a point in the m dimensional space. It is a vector. So it's a point in the m dimensional space. And for some of these vectors, the output is close to one, depending on what the sigmoid function is. And some of these vectors, it is close to zero. So basically, if you think for all these m dimensional points for which the output is one as one set or one class, and all the points for which output is zero is the second set or the second class, the boundary between these two class more or less will look like a straight line or rather a plane or rather a hyperplane it will look like a plane it's a linear curve it's not a curve it's a linear structure okay but the thing is that uh, not all uh, but but the thing is what we actually want to do is that we will be given arbitrary distribution of uh, one class and the second class and you have to draw a boundary between them. So this, uh, this boundary may not be a linear boundary. So this simple perceptron, single perceptron, will not suffice, will not give us a good boundary. Okay, just like linear regression, linear regression is not good enough when you have a nonlinear structure. This is not good enough. But the amazing thing is that even though these individual structures are not good at realizing these things, moment you connect them up you connect multiple of them you can realize actually any nonlinear structure that's why it's sometimes called a universal approximator it can approximate any nonlinear structure those of you in the engineering drawing have used the that french curve you can uh, draw any curve using the french curve so it's like an universal approximator any complex function you give neural network you have you have a neural network which will very accurately approximate that function. So it's an universal approximator. And that was mathematically proved. OK, so now, but the question is, uh, I said that if you connect them up, if you make a network of neurons, you can, it becomes an universal approximator. So now the question is, how do you connect them up? There are many different ways of connecting them up. OK, so how do you connect them up? Uh, so one of the most common way of connecting them up is that uh, it is actually inspired by the digital circuits also that uh, you arrange these individual neurons in layers you arrange them in layers okay so first you have a layer which you call as the input layer which takes the input and then you have one or more hidden layer neurons and then finally you have the output layer neuron. So you arrange them, the neurons, in layers. And what are the properties of this layer? There is no connection between two neurons in the same layer. Okay. 
so there is a, in, as a matter of fact there is a only a forward connection so neurons of one layer can only connect to the neurons of the next layer there cannot be back connection there cannot be connection inside the same layer okay it can, it cannot be there so it can only be a feed forward connection you can only connect to the next layer there are some architecture which connect not only to the next layer but uh, to the next to next layer and all the downstream layers and so on but the simplest one called a multi layered perceptron or a mlp is one which will connect to the only connect to the next layer no back connection no within layer connection no skip connection also okay so that being so actually if you look at it as a graph it will actually look like a directed bipartite set of bipartite graphs okay and not only that we also say that uh, the output from every node of a layer connects to all the nodes in the next layer so you see in, in any layer you take any neuron its output is connected to the, all the neurons in the next layer as inputs okay so this property we call as a fully connected network fully connected feed forward network okay it's a fully connected network okay and and usually we represent this network so it's a there's a, once you have a fully connected feed forward network the only thing you need to mention to specify the network is the number of layers in its node so for example this neuron is a 342 network so three nodes in the input four in the hidden and two in the output okay and, and each of these neurons will be of the structure we already discussed of a perceptron it, it will have a sigma w i x i plus p and a sigmoid function or any activation function on top of that each neuron will be a like that all right so uh, so now if we look at this neural network or a feed forward network each of these connections that we draw you, you can recollect from the structure of the perceptron will have an associated weight okay and what this means for the input layer it's very clear the input will multiply by the weight and add up for the hidden layer the input or the output of the input layer for that matter for the ith layer the inputs are the output of the i minus 1th layer so each of these connections that we see will have a weight associated with it which we call the network weights and it will appropriately multiply for example if you look at the first hidden neuron it will be say w some w1 into the first input plus some w2 into the second input output Second input, uh, second input node output, and so on, uh, and it will add up and apply the sigma. So the thing is that um, every every connection which will, will have a weights associated. Okay, and then people show that this simple fit forward structure. If we take, in fact, the original theoretical proof was you do, you need only one hidden layer. With just a single hidden layer, you can it becomes an universal approximator. Okay, but people actually use more layers for more practical purposes. Uh, uh, but the thing is that the simple fit forward structure is an universal approximator. It can realize any function. It can approximate any function. Not realize, it can approximate any function. The idea actually is very clear. The idea is that any nonlinear boundary you take, this neural network, every perceptron is a straight line. So what moment you connect them, the, Becomes a piecewise linear structure, piecewise linear structure, and you know if you have enough number of small small lines, you can piecewise connect them and approximate an any arbitrary nonlinear function. So that's why this works actually. Okay. By the way, if anybody if, if you have any question or any doubt, you please unmute yourself and speak up. I'll be very happy to discuss. I'll be very happy to discuss. Okay. Okay. So now that I said that, okay, this is this network. And by the way, uh, there are now two things of a network. One is this network structure, which basically says how many nodes in how many, which is layers and so on. 
and then we have a set of weights associated which is which is called the parameters of the network so we have a structure we have a parameter we have already said that this hidden layer structure is enough but now the question is okay this hidden layer structure is enough but what is the combination of weight what is the weight value exact weight values exact parameter values that will give you the best approximation that will give you the best approximation okay so basically what i have is a optimization problem Hmm. What the uh, optimization problem says is that uh, among uh, so you have a you have a space of weights, all possible weights you take. All uh, say there are thousand weights or hundred weights. You take a thousand dimensional space and allow any possible weight values. So every combination of weight value or every network for that matter is a point in this high dimensional space. You take all these weight values. Okay. Now the question is that. Which of this combination of weight values is the best for your problem? How do you find out the best set of weights? Once we have the set of weights, then fine, then we are done. Then in future, what I'll do, new point comes, I'll use this weight to calculate the output, rather a step which is called a forward propagation. I'll use these weights to calculate the output. And once the output is there, I'll use that predicted value. Okay, so once the weights are fixed, it is easy to predict the output. But the question is, how do you get the weights? Okay. So I have already said it's kind of an optimization problem that is find out the best combination of weights. But what is the objective function of the optimization problem? Objective function is nothing. What people do, they have a training set. They do something called a supervised learning. They have a training set for which, for a given input, the output is known. How do you get this? For example, I'm doing yield prediction. What I will do, maybe last 15 years, uh, for different, different crops, I will take the input, whatever input I want, and see what is the actual yield. Because I know it is a history. I know what is the output should be. Okay, so this way, I form a supervised training set, where both input and what should be the correct output that is known. It's called a supervised training set. Input and output is known, or rather the desired output is known. Now, what I will try to do is that I'll find try to find the set of weights for this neural network such that the difference between the actual prediction y that this neural network gives and the desired value, the difference between these two, or maybe the square of the difference between these two, the average value of that is minimum and the mean square error is minimum between the actual output and the predicted output there will be some set of weights for this which which will be minimum okay so how do you find the weight philosophically the idea is like this you draw something called a and this difference between output and input is called a error or maybe a loss sometimes it's also called a loss or error. <laughs> so what do we do? I said that, see, now see, for every combination of weight values, there will be a mean square error because the output is fixed. Depending on the weight value, the predicted output will change. You find the difference between the fixed output, that is the desired output, and the predicted output for that combination of weight value, and take the square of that mean of that. So for every combination of weight, I know a error value. Now, if we, for all combination, all possible different combination of weights, if you plot this error value, you will get something called an error surface. So you imagine, let's say there are only two values, uh, W1 and W2, and imagine the z-axis to be the error. So now, depending on what different, different value of W1, W2 you change, your error value will change. You connect them all up, you get an error surface. You get an error surface. Right, so this way you get an error surface. And now I said that this information problem. So you have to find the set of weight value, which is the lowest point of this error surface, the minimum error, the lowest point of this error surface. You have to find out that value. Right, so, uh, so that is the goal. 
but how to find out that value that is a simple rule see usually this error searching will be very complicated very jagged and uh, rugged and all those things so imagine it like a mountain you are standing in a mountain and what you have to do you have to go to the lowest point in the mountain you have to reach the lowest point of this error surface i am calling it a mountain okay there is a simple rule which will always, almost always work it's called the gradient descent rule it's like this you are at a point you don't have the map of the entire mountain now if you have the map of the entire mountain you can easily reach it but the, in the case of neural network with high dimensional space so such a complicated map you cannot draw okay so what do you do uh, as a just a minute i just uh, okay let me continue uh, okay so what do you do you are standing at a point in the mountain you look around 360 degrees you see that in which direction if i take a step i will go on the maximum steepest descent which direction i have the steepest descent direction okay so look at 360 degree okay maybe there are many possibilities which direction you can move maybe one of the direction in which if you take a step you will maximum decrease in altitude I mean maximum you will descend and maybe two feet you will descend other direction maybe only one feet you will descend okay so you take a step in this deepest descent direction again stand there again look around 360 degree find out which direction again the steepest descent is there take another small small step don't take a big step take a small step again look around keep on doing this hmm. it can be proved that most of the cases if you follow this process you will go to the minimum point of the hill you will go to the minimum point of the hill okay it's a simple rule okay how many steps will you require maybe you will require 10000 steps or 100000 steps that doesn't matter you will do it in a computer so it doesn't matter okay so but this principle is called the gradient descent why gradient descent because if you, if you see if we look at the error function error surface the direction of the steepest descent is nothing but the direction of the tangent direction of the tangent in that Excuse me. It's nothing but the direction. Excuse me, sir. Yeah, please. We are yeah. unable to see your slides, sir. I think it's not moving. Uh, okay. So, are you in the side multi-layer fit forward network? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I am in that slide only. Don't worry. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. 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 Uh, I, no problem. I'm in that slide only. I'm just, I'm just speaking in that side. Okay, so you, you can go, uh, the direction of the steepest descent is nothing but the direction of the gradient, the direction of the tangent of the error function. And this is utilized by an algorithm known as the back propagation algorithm. So what it does, it initializes all the way to a random value. That means you are you are placed anywhere in the hill, yeah, some random many place in the hill you are placed, and uh, then you follow a two-step procedure. For that value of weight, you take the training input, calculate the output by a process known as forward propagation. That means for the input hidden layer you calculate the output. Using that for the hidden layer you calculate the output. Using that for the output layer you calculate the output. So this way you calculate the output. This is known as the forward propagation. And once you have calculated the output, you compare it with the desired output because it's a training set, supervised learning. You know what the desired output is. You compute the difference with the desired output. Now, once this difference is calculated, you take the derivative of this difference. And you calculate basically the gradient of the error function. Uh, you do a local approximation of that first order difference approximation. And that will give you the based on this thing you can calculate. Um, in fact, it's very easy to do this algebra. I'm not doing it here. This is a mean squared error. It's very easy. Um, it's just a chain rule of differentiation. Nothing else is required. Uh, I'm not doing it. Then what actually happens is that this error, this gradient of the error, you back propagate. 
So once you go from input to output, then you go from output to input. So back provided this data by some simple weight update rules. You calculate this delta and all this. Using this weight, weight update rule, you calculate the, uh, the delta, which is the gradient. And then you adjust the weights, you change the weights. Basically, you move to a new position. You take a stiffer stiffness and move to a new position. What is the adjust rule? It is WGI or new. Is WGI old, the fourth point, the fourth point. WGI old plus this delta the change in weight. Please what mute delta? yourself. Please mute yourself. Please mute yourself. Sarita. Mithyasri, mute everyone, mute everyone, Mithyasri. Maybe you can mute it yourself. I mean, from our song, you can, I think we can mute it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so what we can, what we can do, what we do is that this delta W is nothing but this gradient amount of change into one factor eta, which is called the learning rate. Into one factor eta which is called a learning rate. Okay, so that's delta W. And basically you keep on keep on adding this delta W to your old delta old W to get the new W and keep on doing. It. And keep on doing it several rounds. Still you have reached the convergence. Still you have reached the convergence. That means the weight are not changing anymore. Then you say the learning is over. And this final setup weights, you use predictions henceforth. This scheme, works most of the time it will not work in two conditions the steepest descent thing. one thing is that when you are at a local minima that means there is a small minima but that is not the global minima it's kind of a it's kind of a small valley kind of thing it's a small valley and you're stuck in the valley because your steepest descent will always keep you in the lowest point of that valley but that is only a local valley because the global valley is much below which you cannot reach are stuck in the local value. The steepest descent will not take you out of that. Second is you may be stuck in a plateau. Plateau means it is flat. Whichever 360 degree direction you look, the gradient is zero everywhere. All directions are equally good. You don't know the steepest descent direction. There also you'll get stuck. There are some schemes to solve this problem, like the momentum method and such methods are there, which will help us solve this problem. Yeah, basically, this delta WJ is not just eta times the gradient plus some additional terms, which will kind of throw you out of these local valleys or throw you out of the plateaus. Okay, so this scheme is there. This is very popular, and and any of the any of the um, implementations of neural network will you see it will do this. There are differences. For example this error function, do you take the average error over all the entire training set or, and then, then based on that update the weight, which is called uh, batch learning, or, or you every individual input instance you have, you calculate the error and then immediately update the weight. That's called online learning or online gradient descent, sometimes also called the stochastic gradient descent online stochastic gradient is, or you wait for the entire training sample, add up the error and then back to it. It's called the batch learning. It can be in between mini batch learning, which is you take a small number of input, say 100 input or 10 input, then calculate their mean, then update, and then take the next 100. Okay, so this is sometimes called mini batch learning. Hmm, so that also you can do. Okay, so that's up to you, how you calculate the error. Similarly, I have talked about mean square error. There can be other type of error function. For example, there is something called entropy error, cross entropy error. There can be um, the other type of error also. The, say you take the uh, probability of it belongs to this class, take the ratio of the probability, the log likelihood ratio, log of that log likelihood ratio, and you define an entropy based on that and you minimize the entropy. So such error functions can also be uh, used. Only thing is that as long as you can find the gradient, that means the error function is differentiable, and preferably, I mean, convex kind of thing, then it is, it is you can apply the gradient descent of the back algorithm. 
Hmm. And people have indeed used many other type of error function. Okay, so this is in a not cell neural network, but now there are many issues. Like, how do you take the input vector? How do you obtain a good representation, uh, feature representation? We'll see that there are different ways of doing it. For example, if you take an image, do you take all the pixel values of the image or you take some features of the image? You are, you are looking at a canopy of a, of, a, of a plant. Do you take just the raw pixels or you find out some features, how much green, what is the circumference and so on? What is the network topology? Topology means that, uh, that this, how many nodes, how many layers, how they are connected. Okay, how, how do you take the topo uh, network topology, decide the network topology? Currently, this is done by trial and error. You use some number of hidden nodes and increase the hidden node or decrease the hidden node. The thumb rule is the larger your network, more training data you need to significant, I mean, to uh, robustly train the network. Okay. Uh, second, uh, the second is what is the how, how do you choose the network parameters? Then how do you do the training? Finally, when do you stop your training? Hmm. The thing is that if you keep on training, there will be a phenomena called overfitting. That means the data set it will it will fit it will fit to the mind. If you take a very large network, many number of nodes, it will fit the data, including the noise, to the very minutest detail. And that does not have something called a good generalization performance. For unseen examples, it will not do so. Sometimes called rote learning. Unseen examples, it cannot perform. So what you do in addition to your training set on which you are doing the backpagation, you have an additional set of points which you call as a validation test. That's it. And moment your performance in the validation state test set is not decreasing any further uh, or improving any further, um, you keep on doing that training. And then at a point you see your validation set performance is getting static or maybe decreasing also, then you stop your training, stop your training. Uh, so that's called a value. It's like a mock test you take. You, 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 so you are practicing for the exam and whatever, whatever problems you're solving at the end of your book, that is your training set. You are improving your skills by practicing on them. When do you know your skills are enough? You don't have to study anymore. Is that you take some mock tests? That is the validation test. Right? Okay, and then when you are satisfied with your performance on the mock test, you know my learning is over. I did not learn any further. I can stop my learning. Hmm. Uh, but this mock test is not the actual thing. You actually have a test set. Okay, you can use the validation set while training, but the test set is the final exam. And that you can give only once. And, and that performance is what counts also. Okay, so that's the test set. All right, so, uh, all right. So the thing is that, okay, so now these are the issues uh, of this multilayer perceptor. So with respect to this network topology, people did lot of experiment. That means how many hidden nodes, how many hidden layers, all these thing, how much I should take. And uh, then uh, they, they got, they somehow found out that if you increase the number of hidden layers, the performance was drastically improving. Of course, it was taking more time to train, it was requiring more training set data, as I said, the more, the larger the network is, more training data will require. Okay, but the performance is good. And for really large problems, the performance is good. And then they found a, a, a similar thing, a similarity with the human brain. They found that human brain is in layers. It's a deep structure, not just one or two neurons. Several neurons do their own job and pass it on to the information to the higher layer. For example, in a, in a human brain, you will have the, the sensory neurons, what you attach to your eye, your nose, or you have the sensory neurons. And then there are some mid-level neurons, which will uh, take basic features, like what is the color of the object? Is there any bright object, such thing? And this output of these basic features will be going to the higher brain, which will, take, which will do a logical analysis or, or more higher level analysis, like say, if it is a car with a headlight, which is a bright, 
initially the lower brain will only decide it is a bright headlight or not. What to do with the bright headlight? It does not know. It just detects it is a bright headlight. Then the higher structure will take, okay, it is a bright headlight and it is coming towards me. Maybe I should not cross the road. So it takes that decision making. And then finally, you have decision. So basically, there is two main structure. One is the mid-level or low-level feature extractor, which does not take decision, just extract feature. And then there is a higher level decision-making structure, which is in the brain, actually, the uh, some parts of the brain, higher parts of the brain. OK, and, and this everything is it is a it is a connected thing it's not that that some organ some part of us uh, initially detect some feature then then we will wait then another part will do this thing it's not a sequential it is a coupled structure it's a coupled structure okay it will and the thing is that everything is tuned together like how well the optical nerves detect the bright light is tuned by the final decision making, I'll get killed or not. So it has to detect it very fast. The tuning has to be done. So everything is end to end, end to end. Final thing is the decision, end to end person. Individually, you cannot train them. You cannot train a, a optic nerve. When as a child, we learn our eye, train our eye. It is not that I will just look at the bright light and learn that. It will learn bright light in the context of a heading, uh, headlight of a car. Okay, so everything is end to end. And the training is also end to end. Everything together, they are trained. So that thing was kind of mimicked. So in the neural network also, they said that, okay, why not divide your neural network into two parts? One part is will do this feature extraction. And the higher part will do the uh, decision making or learning or high level tasks, whatever you call it. Any questions so far? Anybody, any question? Unfortunately, I'm not able to see the chat box because my, it is full screen here. If anybody has any question, may I speak out? Okay, so okay, so this thing was the motivation, and then uh, this was found. This approach was found very successful in computer vision, signal processing, and and of course, as I said, that okay, there are some bad sides of this also. The larger the network, because if you want to divide it into this kind of layers, your number of hidden layers, number of nodes, neurons will increase. Hmm. The total number of neurons in a human brain is more than the number of atoms in the earth. It's more than that. It's very complicated. No, no, that cannot be. But anyway, it, it is more than the, uh, I'm forgetting, it's more than the stars in the our galaxy or something like that. It's a huge number. We cannot again. Uh, imagine of having a computer having so many, uh, so many such a complicated structure. Okay, so uh, so, and such a complicated structure will need more data. You need larger volumes of data. What happened is that recently, because of digitization, even in agriculture, you can see no longer manually collected with this drone and all these satellite images. You have lots of data. That is an advantage. Secondly, this needs more computational time. And what happened with this availability of this GPU and all this, that also became available. So then there was a huge search. Okay, so the first uh, deep learning architecture which utilized this structure is something called a convolutional neural network. It, it basically is motivated by our optical, our vision system. But nevertheless, it can be applied to any other. It can be applied to any other kind of signal also. Okay, so they say that, okay, similarly, there are three kinds of structure. One is a convolution kind of neurons. So what these neurons do, they are kind of filters. Some neurons which act as filters. They will look at the image and detect what are the bright, what are the edges in the image? What are the vertical lines in the image? Horizontal lines in the image? We'll just detect those things. These are called filters. And these are called, we'll call them as convolution neurons. Because, you know, any filter, when you apply, you have to go through a convolution. 
and then there is based on this convolution you 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 put together so you detect individual lines individual features vertical line horizontal line but you have to combine them and there are some neurons which do that which, which is responsible for that those neurons which get them together are called pulling neurons pull pull neuron pulling neurons and based on these things after they pull together there are another higher set of neurons which we call as fully connected neurons which uh, which will which will use this information to come up with a inference come up with a decision so this is the structure so there are so in summary there are three type of neuron one is the convolution neuron which acts as filters extract image features note that in the original multilayer perceptron there was no this kind of lever division among the neurons everybody did the same thing this division of lever was not there now there is a, the neurons are specialized some neurons do feature extraction some neuron do pulling some neuron take this hmm. so this this is there so this is an example uh, so input is an image let's say optical character recognition and then there is this convolution neurons which will extract these features using some kind of filter and a convolution operation and come up with a filter map output of the filter will be an image map and this pulling layers will kind of subsample and compress the information and put them all together and then finally that's the pulling neurons so the one i showed in uh, in orange uh, convolutions are in green and this structure convolution pulling convolution pulling they will be done several times not once okay so convolution pulling then again convolution pulling on the output of the first convolution pulling again convolution pulling this way why why this is done because see these features are kind of recursive that means you take straight lines or you take points which is the lowest level feature points combine to make lines which is the next level convolution pulling layer lines combine to make polygons which are the third level of thing polygons combine to make objects which is the fourth level of convolution pulling so several of them depending on how many such abstraction you have that will be carried out and finally the fully connected that one i have said that will that will be responsible for the classification of prediction okay so uh, maybe i am not going into detail so this is in sort uh, uh, the convolution layer how it looks like basically you have small small windows or stripes say 3 by 2 or 5 by 5 which has a particular structure a filter structure You you, have, you know the image processing filters. These are filter structures. But the difference with standard filters in signal processing and this, the standard filter, these wave values are fixed. Here, these wave values are adaptive. The back propagation algorithm adjusts the filters in such a way so that they are the fil best filter. So I am not preset that I will detect horizontal line or vertical line. I love filter for that. I am not preset like that. depending on the final end to end task what type of filter maybe a 60 degree line filter is best for me it will automatically tune the weights and that best filter will be used it will automatically find out what the best filter is by the back propagation process in fact we will have not one but multiple such filters and we will get these layers so this is the convolution so this is on the left you see a typical cnn structure it's like image then convolution 64 meaning 64 different convolution filters um, using uh, then the max pooling max pooling i'm explaining what it is then again a set of convolution max pooling now more number of filters 128 filters and so on finally fully connected and before fully connected what we get that we call a feature map and that actually has lot of information okay similarly pulling layer as i have said it is just the average it is down sampling so so what max pulling does it takes a window let's say 5 by 5 window instead of this 25 pixels in a 5 by 5 window it it combines them into a single pixel 25 to 1 how it combines 
it just take the highest pixel value, maximum pixel value. That makes sense because that is the strongest filter response. The strongest filter response is only taken. Okay, so in effect, this is a kind of down sampling. So this is, I'm not explaining, this is what will happen. If you run max pulling, a four by four max pulling on this image, you will get a smaller image with this, this kind of value, max pull, max values. Then we have a fully connected layer. The fully connected layer is nothing but a multi-layer perceptron that we discussed earlier. Nothing but a multi-layer perceptron. But the input is not the raw input. It is these features that all this convolution, max pool, convolution, max pool, these features, say polygon or object, these are the input to this fully connected. They're not the raw pixels. Okay, so that is what is done. It's a simple. And the good thing is that this entire architecture that you see on the left, end to end, it can be trained using a single backpropagation algorithm. You can train this. You go to any library, say PyTorch or TensorFlow or anything, you don't have to do anything. You have to just graphically draw this structure, just using a mouse pool and draw this structure. And mention the error function, mean square error or log interval. Everything else, derivation of the back process and everything, they will do on their own. They'll do on their own. Okay. Mm, so as I have said that it's a single API, they will use that API and, and do it. So these are some example of the activation maps at each layer, that these feature maps at each layer that we are getting. One small thing I'll quickly mention, sometimes the one common problem that is done in image is a classification problem. That is to say a, a crop classification problem. You take the image of a plant, say a drone image, and you have to classify what type of plant it is. It is a weed or rice or wheat or whatever. You have to so you have to put every image to one of these classes. So if there are K number of classes, you take K output, but you don't take the raw K output. You normalize them by a method called a softmax to the power something so that the output values sum to one and they look like a probability distribution. So the output, if we have say three classes, weed and rice and wheat, it will be a three valued probability distribution. And the probability values will take how much likely that input, say if the wheat probability is 0.9, rice is 0.1, weed is zero. It means it is most likely a wheat and so on. So this is called the softmax. So this is there. Okay. So that is it. So this is what I have said. This is an image. I will try to classify it one of these five classes and everything is a differential will function end to end. So 0.3 banana has the highest softmax value. So I'll classify it into that class. Uh, there are some problems with training such a deep network. Uh, it, it is the same back provision is followed, but since it is deep, many of these gradient values they become extremely small or extremely large, called the vanishing gradient, the exploding gradient problem. There are some ways of solving this, like instead of a sigmoid function, uh, you take a rectified linear unit, ReLU, you change your activation function, so that this problem doesn't happen or you use drop out, you randomly drop some weights. Many other tricks are there uh, to avoid such problem, but it is like this. Okay, so next, uh, many variations to this uh, problem is, uh, to this structure is there. Well, instead of a fit forward, it is possible that you have skip connections. That means ith layer, not only connect to the i plus one th layer, it connects to the I plus two, I plus three, I plus four, those layers also. These are called skip connections. Okay, so again, the motivation is sometimes our human vision system or any mammalian vision system often has this kind of skip connection. So this architecture, and the idea is like this, whatever cannot be processed by the immediate fit forward, that residual is processed by the skip connection. So we are looking at an object, some part we can process, some part the immediate neuron cannot process. So it sends it to higher layer. This is called a residual. So this architecture is called a ResNet architecture, residual net architecture, ResNet. 
it's heavier than a, in fact, it performs better than a CNN. This is an example of a net architecture, uh, which is used, uh, and uh, that is very popular. And uh, okay, okay, ResNet sometimes the skip is only one level. I only connects to I plus one and I plus two. If you have all I plus two, I plus three, everything, it's called a dense net. Hmm. So that's even better, but it needs more training data. Hmm. So these problems I have already talked about, that these are some of the challenges of increasing the depth, but there are solutions for them also. Hmm. So these are used. Uh, as I have said, the computational complexity also increases. So this is a nice plot. It talks about the performance in the y-axis and the computational complexity in the x-axis. Okay, so you can see the inception and all these networks, they have a very high accuracy, but they also take a lot of more time. So depending on your application, how much computational complexity you can afford, or how complex your problem is, or how much data you have, you have to look into this chart and decide which deep learning architecture you will use. Okay. That's it. Any, any question up to this? Anybody? Okay. All right. So this is the feed forward architecture. There are other type of architecture also. One, so this is the feed forward, other type of architecture also. So this feed forward or CNN, usually you have a vector type input or the image input, it is fine. But if you have a sequence, let's say a word, a sentence, okay, or, or maybe a time series, then this feed forward does not work. So, or any signal pattern, it does not work. So because you, the length of the sequence will vary, so but in a in a CNN or a feed forward network, the input size is fixed. Also, the sequence structure is not captured. It's only the value. So, for example, these two sentences, the food was good, not bad at all. The food was bad, not good at all. They contain exactly the same words, but because of the sequence, their meaning has changed. So, sequence is very important. So how do you learn a sequence? It, it is using a method called the recurrent neural network. The recurrent neural network. Okay, so the idea is like this, that the left most you see is a simple fit forward network. One input, one output. Next, another alternative is possible. You give an input, there is a hidden layer. The hidden layer produces an output, but produces another hidden state also, the next hidden state also, which again produces a hidden output and produces a third hidden state. So it's a chain reaction. Input, one hidden value, produce output, fine, it emits an output and produces another input hidden state, which produces an input and produces a third hidden state. That is possible. Another situation may be possible. You get an input, you get a hidden state. And this hidden state, along with the next input in the sequence, produces the second hidden state, you, the leftmost figure, rightmost figure. And, and so on. And when you are exhausted with all these hidden states, end of the sequence, you produce an output. So such kind of neural network structures, instead of the leftmost structure, if you can have this other two structure, you can process sequence. There can be this kind of possibilities also. Input and then many to many, and this kind of sequence processing is also possible. So one possible structure which allows you to do this is a recurrent neural network. It is exactly same as the fit forward network, but with a vital difference. The vital difference is that there is a feedback loop. You can see there is a feedback loop. The output of the hidden layer comes back 
and combines with the input next input to produce the input of the hidden layer. So there is a feedback loop. That's the only difference. Uh, if you remove the feedback loop, it's a feed forward network. But this feedback loop helps you have memory. It helps you remember the previous steps of the sequence, previous values of the sequence. Okay. So um, if you write down mathematically, the only difference is earlier the hidden layer is a function of xt only. So ht is a function of xt. Now, in addition to xt, it is a function of xt and the previous hidden layer, old state, ht minus one. Hmm. So ht is fw of ht minus one and xt. That's the only difference. Everything else is same. Okay, so. And you have similar, this FW may be an 10 hyperbolic function or whatever. Hmm. Okay, so this simple structure. As it turns out that this structure can be unrolled into a, 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 a larger multi foot forward network. Hmm. I have already explained it. Same. So it's same as that sequence processing structure we talked about. Okay, with the weight values repeating, same weight values. So these are the structures. And uh, the total loss is computed after the sequence is over. So you have to wait till the end of the sequence to find out the loss. But the good thing is that, uh, good, I'm not going into this, is the unrolled model. The good thing is that the same backpropagation algorithm can be used for trading the recurrent network also. The same backwards and algorithm we can use. Okay, and because it is, uh, because you have unrolled, it's, it's called a backwards and two time. Uh, time meaning the sequence entries. So backwards and two time, same gradient flow, everything you can compute. Here also the vanishing gradient, another problem will be there, but here are solution. So that's exactly the same backwards and algorithm can be used to train it. RNN. Okay, then people found some problem with this RNN also. They found that, okay, it remembers history, but it remembers only immediate past history. It cannot remember very much into past history. Uh -huh. And it does not forget anything. You not only remember, you have to forget things also. To go forward in life, you can, if you remember everything from the past, it is good to remember things from the past. But to remember everything on the past will be too complicated. You, you have to use current information also. So that idea is used in something called a long short term memory. So you have two types of memory. One is a long term. So in a time series, you not only consider the effects which are much, much back in time, you also consider effects which are short term. Okay. So this architecture is an enhancement of the RNN uh, called the LSTM architecture. Mm. What it does, it maintains something called a cell state, and 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 I'll skip this. I will. I will. Okay. So the basic what it does is that the state of a system is updated using some gates which control the memory, and there are four type of gate. One is a forget gate, which decides which path to forget. I'm not going into details. I'm short on time. It will actually take one hour to complete this, but I can give you the material. Then there is an input gate which considers the input of the sequence, not just the hidden states, how to consider them. Then update gate, which one to current information be used to update the state. And then output gate, how to compute the output. Okay. So it, it makes the individual RNN neural network, which is a single type of neuron, simple neuron, replace them by these four kinds of gates together. So one neuron, which we call as a LSTM cell, is a, is a combination of these four type of gates. So this is a four LSTM cells. Uh, so you have a sequence of length three, sorry, this is three LSTM cells. And it, within each cell, there are this, Four type of gates. Earlier RNN only one type of gate, the simple perceptron gate. Hmm. Uh, so this is more complicated, but this is found to be more effective. And again, everything is end-to-end -end differentiable. 
So the same back backpropagation algorithm can be used can be used to train the network. Okay, so uh, so this has been very popular in many time series forecasting, many modern time series forecasting of the LSTM. There is one more aspect which I've not covered. It's called an attention model. <clears throat> so memory, LSTM RNN keeps memory. Attention says that which part of the memory not only you store the memory, it decides how much attention you give the memory. So there are networks called attention networks, which will help you to do this. And combining this LSTM with such attention networks, you have something called transformer network, which are also very good at sequence prediction, time series prediction. <coughs> okay. So with this, uh, I, I kind of come to the end. I, I want to interact with questions. These are the very two good references. One is this free book, Introduction to Deep Learning by Jan Goodfellow. And of course, there is the Stanford Deep Learning course, which has a nice set of video lectures and slides and material. Uh, many of the slides I showed are uh, kind of borrowed from them, not exactly. Mm -hmm. But these are, if you want to go into detail, you should consult this course. Hmm. So with this, I end. Uh, I will be very happy to have some interaction and questions. Is a model. One is a statistical model, uh, usually which is a regression model. So it's a real valued, so it will be regression rather than a classification. So usually it is a regression model, and the regression model parameters they are specific to a region, season, or a crop type. Uh, they are tuned based on this crop type. And these coefficients, uh, they are they are some constant values. They they kind of factor in the influence of soil irrigation, fertilizer, and other variables. So usually, as it turns out, these statistical methods are good if your temporal or spatial scale is on a is large, like a state level or a or a uh, temporal uh, seasonal annual level so there these statistical models do very well but if you come to very precision level uh, very precision level or immediate 15 days down the line before harvesting and so on uh, then this is uh, is difficult it's extremely difficult of course still this is the, the standard crop cutting design up experiment that is very very old and very well time tested thing still they are the most important methods of doing that crop cutting experiments and other and uh, and uh, if you if you look at uh, crop cutting experiments actually were initially started mostly in india so they india that's a big contribution and india was very strong in agricultural statistics and um, in fact, ISI, where I did my PhD from, uh, Mahalanabis, all the early works of ISI um, were related to agriculture. I mean, it, 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 inside ISI, still there are fields inside that. So a uh, lot of work has been done. But they have their limitations. So in fact, uh, the Mahalanabis Crop Forecasting Center, I think you, are, you all of you have know about it. It's in New Delhi, inside. ICR, and they were gradually moving away from the statistical method. They were from this crop cutting experiment. They are going into modern techniques based on machine learning neural networks. In fact, unfortunately, uh, Professor Sivendu Ray, I had long discussions with him about all this. We had several. Hello. Sir, uh, uh, audio is not uh, coming, sir. Uh, probably, I think. Dr. Mitra, whether we have lost connection? Uh, 
I think he has lost his connection. Probably. I am audible to all of you. No. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, sir. Achha, achha. Probably, I think he has lost his connection. Let him come back. this model where where you have actual mechanistic models which will model the dynamics of the growth which will model the dynamics of the growth and then but the thing is that they need a lot of parameters like uh, actual uh, soil parameters plant parameters and then you have statistical models so this crop simulator and the statistical models at a broad scale at a crude scale they work very well on a temporarily larger, like a district scale, they work, but they do not work at a farm scale. Whereas this crop similar simulation model, they work at very precision scale, but you need a lot of parameters which are difficult to supply for a district level or a, or a block level. So each have their pros and cons. Uh, so another, uh, so this is a typical statistical model we had like, uh, uh, typically, they will be like uh, regression equations. And this is a kind of regression equation for different districts of West Bengal for rice. And the parameters are there. The coefficients will tell about the importance of the parameters. And one thing you notice, if you look at the equations, which are the, uh, the regression equations used for prediction, they are different for each district. So one single regression model, this is a big problem. You have to tune them for every different district. Okay, uh, but uh, sometimes, uh, whereas the simulation model, they are mechanistic model, and uh, they are make some simplifying assumption about plant, plant growth and soil uh, evolution. And then they take in a lot of parameter values, initialize them, and they will run the simulation, and then they'll come up with a Phenology and later they'll come up with the yield. Some of the important models for Indian con uh, condition are InfoCrop, Oriza, DSSAT, EPIC. These are the certain things. Sometimes combination of them are used. Uh, some of the inputs that uh, typically these simulation models would require are the weather variables, um, then soil variables, soil layer variables, crop management variables. Um, these are certain things that they require. Mm, once you apply them properly, they give very, very good result. But the question is, often it is difficult to not access to these values. At least you, a farmer, it's difficult for a farmer to get these values. In this situation, that one thing that helps very much are remote sensing images. So these are typically like they will measure reflectance for different bands. One thing typically people do is that using this reflectance values, they compute something called a vegetation index, which kind of measures certain properties of the plant or the canopy, like uh, amount of chlorophyll, biomass, and, and such, such things. There are numerous, uh, numerous indices available, like NDVI, EVI, EVI2, RVI. I have listed some of them and the formula from computing them from the band. This band, NIR, red, all this means, this is like near infrared, red, this kind of reflectance values for this band. And uh, they are, depending on the resolution of the satellite sensor, they can calculate this for various uh, scales. And they calculate things like the chlorophyll content and, and biomass content, such things. So this chart is very useful. If you are trying to do a remote sensing based uh, yield prediction, depending on what type of yield prediction problem, what scale, what temporal scale, 
you have to decide which kind of vegetation index to use. Some more new have come up. These are quite old. Some new have also come up. So if you look, go to Google Earth Engine, many of these indices will be available for all over the world for MODIS and some satellites. One good approach is you, you kind of use this satellite imagery to refine your simulation or statistical models, to validate them, re-estimate them, retune them using the remote sensing. So one of the first work which used uh, the combination of satellite images and local statistical and simulation models is this work called SCHEME, Scalable Satellite-Based Crop Yield Mapper. It was done at Stanford University uh, jointly with Google. And this was very popular. This was very fast and you can very easily use it. I think it is available with Google Earth also and it works all over the world. So what these people at Stanford did was they, they, for different, uh, they targeted the maize plant for USA. They went to different, different locations in USA, a lot of locations. They took the parameters and they ran their simulation models and they calculated the NDVI and created a big library of these possible NDVIs. And for a new place, they look at the satellite data and they compare the satellite data with this dictionary and find out what is the best model to use, best simulation model to use, and then use that simulation model. Sometimes it turns out it's not a single simulation model, but multiple simulation models are good enough. And then they take an ensemble of that. Hmm. And this, this finding out how much a satellite observation matches with the data, uh, the simulation data, they used a simple machine learning algorithm. This was one of the earliest use, 2015. It was, it was very well cited and proper. And this curve, actually, I'll, I'll keep on showing this type of curves. The x-axis is the predicted yield. Y-axis is the actual yield. So a 45 degree line, if uh, and each point is a different location. A 45 degree line would mean a good agreement between predicted and actual. You can see for all these states of the USA, this method kept okay, pretty good close to the 45 degree line prediction. The good thing was this was very scalable. You can very easily adapt it. You don't need to spend a lot of time to uh, do this for a new place. A very similar but much more elaborate system was is used in India in MNCFC. It's called the FASAL system. It's forecasting agriculture using space, agrometeorology, and land-based observation combines all these three. It's very sophisticated. It's one of the best in the world, actually. So what it does is the following. It uses some static data collected all over the country, like soil type, uh, crop practices, with uh, such things. And it has a library of such static data. And it uses a number of dynamic data, like the weather conditions, uh, crop that are cultivated, management practices, some remote sensing indices, NDVI and other RS products. And using all these dynamic data, they, and all these they get by a network. They have a huge network all spread all over the country to collect this data. And then they tune their crop models, the static for crop. And then they run this, and depending on the output, they validate it, something like that scheme uh, Stanford University approach. They verify it using the remote sensing data. And depending on that, they tune the models. And they give a two stage output. First stage, they tell about the phenology and the growth factors. And in the second stage, they give the actual yield. And this entire thing is refreshed regularly as and when data comes up. Okay, and this is at MNCFC ICAR, and this is this works very nice actually. You can go to the website, and if you give your region and other such parameters, and the crop and everything, it will give you a prediction. Okay, uh, but uh, currently, even though this is in practice, looking into the future, in fact, uh, MNCFC is also moving towards this direction. There are some challenges, for example, the remain. For example, these factors I said, they are very complex. How they interact is very complex. 
measurements are imperfect. There is a lot of uncertainty in them. The data is incomplete as far as long-term record management is not there. And there is often a sudden change in agricultural practice. Some strange region, there is a change in agricultural practice. And of course, there are extreme events and climate uncertainties. So how do you handle it? So one of the, so naturally machine learning has proved to be, as you can guess, very popular. A typical machine learning flow pipeline will look like this. So there will be a lot of these input variables like climate, water, soil related to, and, and people use different, all different kind of things. So all these things will be there. You have these climatic variables, all these things. And then these variables may be collected using say sensors or so ground-based sensors, surveys, satellite data, UAV data, weather prediction, a lot of sources this data come from. And then you build a training data out of this. For us, that's the most difficult part, build the training data. And then you try out your machine learning models. One thing you typically do, you study the feature importance which features are important, which features I should take. It's a very critical aspect. And then you validate them and finally get to the prediction. The thing to be noted here is that this y equal to g cross e minus b, these simulation models, this dynamic or simulation based model, they are replaced by these complex machine learning algorithms, complex mappings. That's the key idea. They are replaced. Okay, and this is just a just a, uh, a kind of map, maybe, of the literature of all the different machine learning algorithms people have used. You can I'm I'm not going into detail. You can go through it. Maybe you can go through this paper also. Uh, this is a big survey of all the different machine learning algorithms that people used. So what I'll do is that. I will explain some typical papers or typical cases uh, that have been uh, that are successful. So, in general, if you want to do research and yield prediction using machine learning, this is the methodology you will have to follow. You have to first do a data collection, then, of course, do some data processing because there are a lot of missing data, variable selection, unnecessary variables you have to do. Then, in either do a using machine learning to a, do a regression or a classification, regression will give you the actual value, classification will tell you that uh, whether the yield will increase or decrease and so on. And finally, you get the yield. So choosing the machine learning model is what is the topic of today's lecture. But in practice, most of your time will be spent on the data collection and data preparation part. Because this machine learning part, they are just libraries. You can very easily play with them. Okay, so first I'll start with one of the work that we did uh, with a student. It is a very simple work. So what we do is we try to predict the, using a simple multi-app accept and we try to predict the curry price yield in West Bengal. So we took the, from the MODIS data, we took NDVI at block level for JJS and O, June, July, August, September and O. And then we took a lot of weather variables like rainfall, temperature, solar radiation, humidity at a monthly scale. We took a lot of non-weather variables, typically fertilizer consumption. This we got from the agricultural offices. And uh, we did not consider the soil type or seed variety. And we used a simple multi-lab acceptor. The study area were some districts in West Bengal, excluding Kolkata. And uh, these are some of the figures. So these are some of the districts in the map that we saw. And we found a very high correlation over the years between the predicted. So there are some districts which did have a very high correlation. And there are some districts which didn't have so much of a good correlation. Okay. Typically, we found that uh, that rain fed and non rain fed, uh, and also depends on how much data we have in the district. West Bengal typically is, uh, does not have a lot of data. If you go to Karnataka, Maharashtra, uh, they have a lot more detailed data available. So, a better study can be done there. 
Okay, and this is some of the results just to show uh, for two districts, Purulia and Makura, and these are non-irrigated, these are in fed crops. And we did get a good value using the data. So these are typical studies you can do. A lot of people have done. If you go to the literature, you'll see hundreds of studies like this. And uh, But the, even though from the machine learning point of view, this is not a big contribution, but sometimes, in fact, this study was one which is kind of commissioned by MNCFC uh, to, for West Bengal at block level. Okay, so now what we'll do is that you remember this picture, remember this picture. So now if we look at the literature, depending on what type of variable you take, what is the sensors, uh, satellite or drone, and what region and uh, you have different, different combinations, depending on what machine learning algorithm you use. So depending on these various combinations, we have numerous studies. So I'll quickly uh, refer to some of them. So this is one work in, published in computer and electronics in agriculture. This is, uh, it is a, it is a, uh, uh, they took a multispectral image captured from UAV. And based on that, they kept, did the vegetation indices. Little bit of environmental factor. So now let us, let us look at it like this. You have these images, spectral images, NDVI images. You have weather data, you have soil data, you have farm management, nutrition, nutrient data. Okay. And, uh, Depending on how much you have at your disposal, how good your model is that determines that. Okay, so this work, they use these indices as well as little bit of environmental data. Okay, and uh, what they did was they kind of used a CNN. <laughs> so this is the overall architecture. Uh, they used a CNN, they took these NDVI images and uh, it's kind of an image regression problem. So input is this, this uh, so primarily input is this NDVI kind of spectral images. They run a, and run a CNN on that. Parallel to the CNN, they lit, use little bit of environmental data. They use little bit of environmental data. Okay, and combining these two, uh, they make the final prediction. And these are the kind of results. Uh, this is kind of results. So these are kind of some of the images, uh, some of the patches actually. And there's a color coding from the, uh, based on uh, the NDVI values, RGB values. So you look at three, the leftmost image would be the NDVI, then the RGB image, and finally the yield prediction. Okay, and the yield is on a color scale. So more or less good result this get. So this was based on just CNN. Just you look at the image, use a CNN and predict it. Then people gradually started using time series. So they started uh, going for time series kind of study. And then they combined this. Uh, so they now they are the sequence of temporal images. Uh, sorry, they are sequence of special images. So they have a temporal sequence of images. And this, this study is very important. And uh, this study is this uh, Frontiers in Plant Science 2020 study. Look at the structure, it's a very interesting structure. So they have all these spectral images and on that they run CNN. They extract the features. We decide, so what features are good for yield? Uh, you can use domain knowledge, you can use automatic feature extraction using CNN, so find out some good feature. And they take a sequence of such feature as input to a recurrent neural network. Okay, so this is a time series. The time series is not a plain and simple time series. It's a time series of features where the features are extracted using CNN on the vegetation in these images. Hmm. Plus, there are some additional time series data like weather, uh, soil and all these kind of data are also there. They are also fed into the time series. And they combine all this to, add, so you remember the original RNN picture, which is a many to one. You wait for all the inputs and end of the sequence, you get a yield prediction. Okay, and, and standard thing is used. 
So gradually you can see these gives kind of gives a picture how you can exploit deep learning for this problem. Hmm. So yield prediction, the thing is, it's not like a plain and simple uh, just a sequence prediction. You, the, the, what to be what sequence to be considered itself is non trivial. You have to extract features. You have to use the weather data. You have to use a lot of other data. So this sequence you use. But typically, yield prediction is a sequence. The, the plan goes through a sequence of growth cycles and finally gives an yield. OK, so this is a typical deep learning architecture uh, that you can use for that. And everything is trained end to end. This is a result for the corn, corn yield prediction in USA. Actually, they have a quite uh, good yield. And somebody asked the question, how do you understand what features are there? So what they did from the final set of features, they did kind of uh, trace back and see that which in physical input features have high weightage in this combined features. OK, and they found that this feature importance said that precipitation, then solar radiation, and this maximum and minimum temperature. So these are the importance. Okay, these are the importance, and this uh, it's it's a time series. So this importance, uh, so it's a sequence of features. So the feature of today has some weightage for these values, but after fifteen days, this weightage of these factors may change. So you see, the x-axis is the week, and the y-axis is the importance of these features. So you see, in the initial days, uh, initial days, this uh, this this is important. This uh, this maximum temperature is important. In the middle days, kind of solar radiation and minimum temperature is important. Whereas towards the end days, the precipitation is important. Hmm. So this is kind of a nice way of explaining things that in the growth cycle, in the sequence, at which point of time, which feature is important. Okay, and this is useful for uh, deciding your farm management practices also. Okay, uh, this is the next study, which goes one step further. So it uses all these kind of agrometeorological variables. This is one of the recent study, this got published in Nature Scientific Report 2020. It was done by University of Iowa. And uh, these are the features they took, like the surface temperature, uh, average surface temperature, minimum surface temperature, uh, the maturity genotype that they classified the genotype into clusters, precipitation, uh, irradiance, and such things they took. And uh, what they did was they used an LSTM. They used an LSTM, in fact, not one, they used a stacked set of LSTM. I have not discussed that. You can often stack LSTM. So uh, once the low level, there is a sequence and produces an intermediate sequence, which again uses another LSTM to produce a higher level sequence and so on. So you kind of take into account seasonality and other such things. So they use a stack of LSTMs and the encoding was, uh, encoding was, uh, I don't know if you, I have not told about it. There is something called embedding vectors like uh, what to make another. So use the, the converted, the, it's kind of extracted, non-linearly extracted set of features. They use those features and they combine the genotype as well as the weather variables. And using this LSTM, stacked LSTM, they finally got a prediction. Finally got a prediction. And this method is one of the state of the art. This is one of the, I mean, uh, best methods you can see today. It's very state of the art. Hmm. Their code is available, open source, so it can be used. But it is for males, and it requires a lot of genotype information besides the weather information. Okay, so with this state of art in this aspect, that is just based on the genotype or weather variable or multispectral features like uh, remote sensing features, and using this sequence and all this, what you can do. The next jump, which is uh, just uh, beginning to come, uh, is something like this. So, see, remember in the beginning, 
we talked about uh, statistical model we talked about simulation models and we talked about machine learning models okay and then uh, lot of input like remote sensing data whether data are available but the question is this three type of models can they be combined into one hybrid type of model can they be combined into a hybrid type of model so this is a very recent work um, by sahoseni et al it came up in nature scientific report in march of this year so which is which is coupling the machine learning models and crop model and this is the way to go in future so what did these people do is that and they take the take this uh, with that data soil data management data in data is the supervisory thing that means the desired output and then they do a crop modeling for a region and then they do lot of prediction using the crop model like yield power in prediction biomass prediction water stress prediction and based on this study they identify some important features that the machine learning model should use so they use a crop model to identify important features and these features are used by the machine learning model to get the final yield so these features are used to get the final yield so for the corn production this is one uh, typical study uh, i would like to give is that so they used uh, for this crop model and they use something called a, this epicim agricultural production system simulator epicim It is a, which is works well for corn. We use that, and this is a list of features, the, and these are ranked in the order of importance. So the longer they grow, uh, the more important they are. And the blue one that you see are the weather features. That are, by the way, this uh, this plant features are extracted by EPSIM, but weather features are state arranged. So you see, these weather features are the blue ones. And you see, now some of them are pretty important. Some of them are pretty important. Okay, and uh, this uh, this uh, epicim features are the red ones or, or the orange ones. Uh, they are they are also important. Some of them like average uh, leaf development or stress or weather features like total precipitation, and these are pretty important. But one interesting thing they found out. Uh, which because what the question in the last session is that so if you look at this machine learning so use they, they found out some of these features not and this machine learning they also use the lstm cnn kind of combination if you try to explain the features of the cnn lstm and you find out some of the artificial not physical uh, but artificial features we call them as constructed features they are very successful this green one it's such a non explainable but a constructed feature using the cnn rstm and you find that it outweighs all other features is much more successful much more uh, important from the point of view of prediction so this is an interesting operation uh, this means that um, there are actually some non linear features which you don't understand directly in terms of the observable variables but this these features are very important so there are some unknown features which are very important okay and this all this deep learning business is helping us extract or find out those features that is the moral of the story okay and they found they did some study that um, the, the the top rows are the are the simple neural network model without hybridizing with the crop model and this again the same x axis is predicted y axis is actual so 45 degree line they should be close to the bottom one are the ones which combine the crop model with the prediction model and you see the bottom one the red ones the much better okay the uh, red one are much better they are much closer to the 45 degree line so the moral of the story is if you combine such crop model with your rnn lstm or cnn lstm models you can get much better result and that's where the future direction goes 
Okay. Another problem um, that I have been talk about. So all these statistical model and also machine learning model, they are very region and crop, crop specific. You, you must have seen something works for one district will not work for another district. Something which works today uh, for this kind of uh, kharif crop will not work for the other crops. So, so it's it's very specific. Uh, the the simulation models are extremely specific, uh, particular farm. But even statistical and machine learning models are very specific. The flip side of this is, uh, you go to a new place, new crop, new weather. You have to all together from scratch build a model. From scratch, you have to build a model. Hmm. Uh, that takes a lot of time. Uh, just a minute, I just have a glass of water and come back. Just give me a minute. Okay, yeah, I'll just come back. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so one of the problem is you have to again from scratch build a model, you go to a new place. Okay, so one naturally question is that, can you reuse some of these efforts that you have spent to build a model for a place? Uh, so in other words, so this problem in, in agricultural statistics uh, literature is called as a domain shift problem. So you shift your domain, your models break down. Okay, so there is one direction of research which is called transfer learning. That means uh, you have built a model for a certain situation. You go to a new situation with a little bit of modification. Can this old model be adapted to the new situation? And that's the idea. Okay, and, and there is a huge body of literature in machine learning about this transfer then the neural network like weight initialization is a scheme. And there are uh, many other possibilities. Okay, so this is one work which uses a generative adversarial network, a GAN network uh, for transfer learning. Okay, so what it does is that uh, there are two parts of a network. One part, what it does, it does the yield prediction. Another is which, which predicts the domain. So what type of domain it is. Okay, so one part tries to do a yield prediction. So you have a network, network bifurcates as it goes deeper down the layers. One part will do a yield prediction and one part will do a domain prediction. And the domain prediction will be, you, and these two will co-evolve, uh, co-trained actually. And this domain prediction will kind of later help the yield prediction. And so there's a feedback, it will go back. You can see it will predict the domain that will go back and get the initial set of features and then come back into the yield prediction. Hmm. And so this method is very good for transfer learning or handling domain. See, there are other works also. So this is a recent work, uh, I think just two, three months back in computer and electronics in agriculture. It's called an adaptive adversarial domain adaptation approach for phone yield prediction. Okay, so so in India also, because of this wide variety of uh, thing, uh, this domain transfer is very important. 
Okay, so let me now summarize. I have uh, two, three works I have presented. So based on the study, if you want to start in work, so this is a survey uh, based on the survey paper. I am just listing based on the survey in how many studies popularity of the features like uh, leaf and fruit information, irrigation information, soil property, vegetation index. I'll share the slides with you. So these are the this. So this is a quite reflectance of the what how effective these features are because they are used in most of the studies. So you can see vegetation index is very commonly used. Yield data so is commonly used because it's a time series problem. Climate information is widely used. So these are the information that is widely used. What are the popular algorithms? So this is based on this recent survey. Though this is based on palm oil, and there is a section on other crops also. And this is a for the benefit of the participants, I can tell that what are the popular algorithms. So you see the most popular is random forest RF still, then multilayer perceptron ANN, then logistic regression, and then the sentry. Uh, okay, the SVM also, uh, CNN also. A uh, little bit of LSTM and CNN RNN also. So you can see there is a lot of gap. There are a lot of other machine learning algorithms like XGBoost and other that are yet to be explored. So you can try them out. That is the best is you define your own architecture. Define your own architecture. Okay, and this is a survey of the crop studied. Um, the highest is okay. The, the, they consider palm oil. They leave that out. The highest is uh, corn and wheat, uh, paddy also. But there are a lot of other crops for which, and each crop has its own challenge for variables and other. Uh, so that's uh, that's a open area of study. So in summary, uh, crop yield prediction is a, uh, just one more thing I'd like to mention before I close. Uh, so, uh, okay, for your own particular domain, you can do, but there is one benchmark data set just for the learning purpose you can do. This is a challenge for the Syngenta crop analytics challenge. There's a huge prize for this. So, what these people do, they want to develop new genotypes which will give good aid. And they don't want to wait for two, three years to cultivate and do it. So, they want to use machine learning uh, for a a possible genotype what will be the yield and, and then they'll choose the best one so this is a contest there's a huge prize for it uh, and uh, typical related hybrid all this data is given there is a paper that last year winner 2019 winner was uh, this group Said and Lizzie they use deep networks for this this paper is available in plant science but still it is open so you can if you are interested, you can work on this challenge. And also, lot for India, a lot of this uh, vegetation in this crop maps, you can freely download from MNCFC, from Google Earth also, MNCFC, a lot of weather parameters for IMD. Uh, so MNCFC has intentionally published this data so that you can um, work on new models, new things to do the prediction. So you are welcome to work on this. So in summary, uh, crop yield prediction is a complex problem. Machine learning can supplement traditional methods. This is a very important point. You can supplement. The best way is to combine them. Remote sensing is a very important data source besides sensor and historical data. Uh, and But the data gap, missing data is still a major problem. So if you can work on machine learning algorithms, which can work on missing data and uncertainty management and all those things that will be great work. So none of these, like all these Bayesian techniques, Bayesian deep learning, which not only gives predicts the yield, but also gives the uncertainty in the prediction. And that's also very important for a lot of the results. Okay, so this is important. And there are a lot of related problems where it helps, uh, helps like yield gap estimation, management region segmentation, which part you spend more money, uh, so decision recommendation in precision agriculture. Okay, so these are some of the related problems which use the yield prediction.
So it's a very open problem, perhaps one of the most studied problem in applying machine learning to agriculture. And you are welcome to work on any of these. So with this, I end. Uh, some of the future directions I'd like to mention, you can always keep on building more accurate and more elaborate deep learning models. You can incorporate, so this is called hybrid physics and data-driven learning. So you can incorporate plant models along with machine learning. Transfer learning, how do you downscale yield prediction? If you have a crude scale in yield prediction, how do you downscale? And often this yield prediction is more useful when you use it together with other related tasks that is, gives much more value, like price prediction and others. So with this, I end. And uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, one of the projects we are doing funded by Ministry of Information and Technology. Mm, it's on AI in agriculture, AI for agriculture. And of course, it's, it's kind of a holistic where we develop all kind of uh, AI. We, we, our goal is to build a AI library for different kind of prediction and classification tasks that uh, you encounter in agriculture. Okay, so this is the thing. So with this, I stop. Uh, if there are any questions, I will be happy to answer. So, uh, students, uh, now session is open for questions, and 